Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm talking about the uh, problem of, of evidence. Um, well, when I first uh, started working on philosophy of probability, I had my reservations regarding veganism. But I wasn't really able to articulate the nature of my words. So I actually was very happy with the invitation to speak here because it's a good opportunity to sort of gather my thoughts on this subject. Okay, this is actually a slide which I use in my course to introduce students to the core concepts uh, of Bayesianism. So I tell them there is this um, mental attitude of uh, credence or degree of belief. I tell them that there is uh, an ideal, a norm, that these degrees of belief should be coherent. And I tell them that there is a norm on what you should do when you are faced with new evidence. You should apply Bayes' rule, you get a new probability function by conditionalization on the evidence. Okay, but there is, uh, so in the coherence uh, constraint, there is a reference to probability theory. So basically, degrees of belief should be as if they are the values of the probability function. And uh, if you are serious about that, uh, that, that should be your function, then at least you should specify what is the domain, which, what is the set uh, on which this um, function will take values. Uh, so in the case of a probability function, this is called an event space, and basically the idea is that we have a set of atomic possible outcomes, the sample space, and then you have a collection of subsets from the sample space, and this uh, set algebra is called the event space, you can do uh, equivalently um, the same thing in a sentential algebra and use a language. But in any case, this has to be uh, specified up front. And if you look at applications of probability in the sci sciences, this event space has a quite limited scope. For instance, you want to model um, a, a random walk, you want to model a toss with a die, something like that. Whereas, if you look at how people sometimes talk about it in the context of philosophy, uh, it is suggested that you can apply this to every thinkable thought or something like that. Or more in particular, in the context of philosophy of science, uh, this should uh, range, the function should range over um, scientific theories. And my objection to that is just that in science there can be genuinely new theories that you couldn't have foreseen. So it's not clear to me that you can make the event space big enough such that all later changes in the probability can be captured by this conditioning. So the claim is that theory change is something not um, in the Bayesian, not the orthodox Bayesian uh, uh, approach. So on the one hand I'm saying, well, orthodox Bayesian isn't uh, rich enough to deal with theory change because it's not just conditioning, it's really a more fundamental change in the domain of the function. But on the other hand, obviously, uh, any formal system has limitations. That's not an argument to say, let's stop uh, trying to make a formal system. It's just an invitation to be more creative about it. And I think there are things you can do which still are in the Bayesian spirit, although not orthodox anymore. So basically, I structured the talk into two parts. First, I want to refresh our memories about this problem of old evidence and some well-known reactions to it. And then I want to address uh, our proposal. And I should say this is joint work in progress with my colleague in Groningen, Jan Willem Kommen. So the classical reference for the problem of old evidence and new theories is to uh, Clark Lehman's book, Theory and Evidence, and in particular this chapter called Why I'm Not a Bayesian. And even the title seems very popular because there are many other similar titles. I don't know which was the original one, but I saw things like Why Glimmer is a Bayesian, Why Isn't Everyone a Bayesian, Why I'm Not a Non-Bayesian, and I don't think I find them all. But in any case, the content of the chapter is um, a discussion of Bayesian confirmation theory, uh, especially uh, the identification of certain shortcomings, and then one of those shortcomings is the problem of old evidence and new theories. And this is um, um, a friction, a tension between 
on the one hand, historical examples, and on the other hand, the normative Bayesian approach. And there are three uh, examples in the book that I'll focus on the third one, which involves uh, the perihelion advance of Mercury, which was observed in the 19th century and uh, was also, one also tried to calculate its value based on masses of the planets and, and, the, and so on. And there was a difference between the observed value and the calculated one based on Newtonian physics, and that is why it was uh, considered an anomaly. There were hypotheses uh, what could cause this difference between theory and observation. One was that there could be an additional planet not observed so far somewhere between Mercury and the Sun. And then later on, when general relativity was developed, uh, Einstein at a certain point realized that this, based on this theory, he could uh, make a computation about the advance of this perihelion of Mercury, and he arrived at the correct value, the measured value, without any additional hypothesis about some unobserved planet. So this was considered to be a strong confirmation for the new theory of general relativity, although the data was, old, was well known. Um, and this is in contrast to the normative side, because Bayesian confirmation theory tells us that old evidence simply cannot confirm new theories, because once the evidence comes in, uh, the ideal or the norm of conditioning tells us we should revise our probability functions by conditioning uh, on this new evidence. So when there is at a later point in time a new theory, and once again we condition on the old evidence, it will not change the probability function because it was already taken into account once. So in particular it will not raise the probability um, anymore. And that is uh, usually considered, the difference between these two is usually considered as a measure of the confirmation, so there is no confirmation. Uh, even if you go to Jeffrey conditioning, you can still have a small increase of probability, but uh, you don't get this big step which you would intuitively expect from the descriptive side that this old evidence gives strong confirmation, you simply don't cash that out uh, in the values here. Okay, um, so one distinction that has been made in the literature is of course between theories that were specifically aimed at explaining the old anomaly versus theories that were not intended to do that but then were surprisingly found to, to have this effect. So one example could be uh, the Bolton hypothesis that, could be, that was designed and added to Newtonian theory and using the uh, terminology from the talk I recently heard by Juanes, you could call that like a post hoc monster. And the other side um, would be uh, Einstein's theory. It wasn't intended to explain the, away the anomaly, but it was then real <coughs> that it did. And of course, the post hocness in itself need not be so problematic because there are successful examples. Like uh, there was also um, an anomaly in the orbit of Uranus. And then it was hypothesized there could be an additional unobserved planet, and indeed Neptune was discovered. And actually, this was this happened before uh, the problem with uh, Mercury. So I think that this sort of lended uh, credibility to the possibility that there could be another unobserved uh, unobserved planet. Uh, so until the time that general relativity uh, was discovered, it wasn't so uh, strange to hypothesize in this direction. Okay, so to come back to some reactions to the problem of old evidence, uh, a popular one by, um, uh, by Carver was uh, the idea that what is being discovered, what is new, is that the theory entails the old evidence. So for instance, in this general relativity example, and uh, maybe you can um, encompass that in the theoretical framework by weakening the assumption of logical omniscience. And this response was anticipated uh, in Glimmer's <coughs> because he already um, said that yes, this is 
an essential uh, observation. Scientists are not perfect logicians, but they seem to doubt that such semi-rational behavior can be captured in the formal framework. Um, nevertheless, I think many uh, authors think that the problem of logical omniscience is indeed relevant uh, or the most relevant observation concerning uh, this problem of old evidence. For instance, in a recent review of Bayesianism and its problems, Kenny Swaran writes that uh, we clearly require, there is clearly required a solution to this problem of logical omniscience, and maybe that's even a good thing because we have that problem anyway, so now we only have to solve one instead of two. Uh, there are other approaches, for instance, uh, one suggestion is that uh, what to measure confirmation using probability changes, we shouldn't contrast the probability of the new theory given the evidence with the absolute probability of that theory before taking into account the evidence, but rather contrast it with what the probability of the theory would have been conditional on the negation of the evidence we actually got. So then here we have a counterfactual probability, and that is again the nature of the trouble because um, it's hard to see how exactly we should estimate these probabilities, whether they should be um, um, historically accurate, and whether we are then more uh, doing theories about individual scientists in history, or is this really the goal of the enterprise? It's not so clear. Now, there are other authors, although they are fewer in numbers, that uh, stress the problem of new theories rather than just the problem of old evidence. And uh, one of these uh, authors is Erman, who writes um, that the, there are um, the introduction of new theories creates a problem uh, at the level, at the mild or a stronger <coughs> level. Uh, one is that you can have, I will, I will put it in the words I was using, using earlier, you have a sample space, and it may be that you did your job well, you still keep the sample space, but uh, within that space you carve up new hypotheses, or something like that. So that could be uh, related to the failure of logical omniscience, but there could be a more radical problem or a more radical change as a new theory is developed, namely that the sample space itself will need to be revised. And then, of course, we are outside the scope of the usual patient updates of probabilities, and uh, even the mild form where you just carve up the uh, space of possible uh, yeah, possibilities in a different way, uh, it will require a non-Bayesian update. So with this second approach to the problem, namely the one focusing on new theories, I come to our own proposal. <coughs> I'm not suggesting that this talk is um, anywhere on the road to solving the problem. Maybe we are even making it worse. Um, but yeah, you'll see. What, yeah, I, I, um, I have changed my mind a bit about how to uh, um, present the second part, but I think maybe the easiest way would be to start from the Mercury example again and see, uh, let's try to go straight forward and try to cast that in terms of sample spaces and probabilities. And I already mentioned that this is a completely naive depiction, and I will actually criticize it uh, later on in the talk. But suppose we have uh, a space, a sample space, and we carve it up into various hypotheses, which are in this case actually theories with possibly um, auxiliary hypotheses. We can even include things that were already updated, um, anything you like, a Newtonian theory, maybe the sun was not completely spherical but oblate, and we have this Vulcan hypothesis. So if I make a guess about how the probability function looked like before general relativity, I assume maybe the Vulcan hypothesis together with Newtonian theory was the most popular one, so it gets the highest uh, probability. Okay, now with the introduction of general relativity, something strange happens because uh, we have a new hypothesis, 
that's not part of the old sample space, once it's realized that this can explain this old uh, phenomenon concerning the uh, precession of the perihelion of Mercury, this becomes uh, very likely that this is the right approach. So we assign high probability to the new theory. But something completely um, yeah, ugly happens in a sense to the theory because we now are working with a new sample space. So in any case, the probability change cannot have happened like conditional. Now, we can maybe do slightly better. By, so we are moving back again to a time where no one has the idea to explicitly formulate general relativity yet. But still, we add an option to the sample space which has no positive content, only the negative assertion. It's none of the other explicitly formulated theories. So some people may have already realized before general relativity was there that this uh, Vulcan hypothesis was quite unlikely. And it could be that we need a completely new approach. And you could uh, foresee a, a, a place for future developments in the theory already in the sample space. Now, it's not completely clear that this is correct approach because, first of all, this uh, catch-all hypothesis, um, as it's called, has a quite different structure than all the others. It doesn't have any positive content, as I already mentioned. So it seems to live on like a higher order algebra where you can refer to the other hypotheses. But OK, maybe we can uh, work around that. Then another observation is that any new explicit theory to be developed in the future will be a part of what is the current catch-all. So we sort of shave off part of the catch-all and leave room for a new catch-all to uh, leave room for even further developments. But for the probability, that means that you are in a system of, let's say, diminishing returns because the new probability of the new theory can never exceed the prior probability of the old catch-all. Um, and that brings me to like uh, even a, a worse problem, and that is that it's not clear that we can, in any sensible way, assign a probability to the catch-all at all because again, because it's such a different um, thing that in the other cases you have specific theories and you can sort of compute probabilities of evidence, you can uh, make predictions, you can do experiments within them, and these will all lead you to revise probabilities. But the catch-all is of a different nature, so you may doubt that you can assign a probability to that at all. So a humble suggestion would be um, to assign probabilities only, well, actually only to assign probability ratios. So you can compare, compare any of the two explicit, um, any two of the explicitly formulated theories, their uh, probability you can compare as a ratio, but you never include in any of the comparisons the catch-all. So you leave it completely open what the probability of that is compared to the right theory already being among the first N options. And this proposal has been called humble Bayesianism, uh, for instance. OK, now what happens to the old evidence? Now here, the observation is that this may also change uh, in the context of a new theory. So for instance, um, in the case of Newtonian physics compared to general relativity, just the basic variables that you are working on are changed. So if you consider evidence as a part of the um, sample space, just like hypotheses are certain volumes, so to speak, in the sample space, um, this may actually change if just your whole coordinate system changes. And again, that will be um, yeah, something that's not covered in the usual Bayesian um, system. Okay, so to make it again a bit more vivid, what I mean by this is uh, what, once the um, uh, advance of the perihelion of uh, Mercury was measured, that was a value, you could call that beta. And it's only if you frame it in terms of theory that it may be something that you call an anomaly. 
So if you uh, do the computations in, with only the Newtonian theory, you get this difference between the observed and the theoretical value, and you will s refer to the, to the data as the anomaly. So I'm trying to make a distinction between the raw data, so to speak, and the evidence, which already is um, phrased in, in terms of the current theory. And then, of course, once you have general relativity, uh, you don't have to put in this value by hand, or you don't have to suppose <coughs> a planet and sort of put in by hand what the mass has to be, just so that this could have this effect on the, um, on the orbit of Mercury. So you don't need any additional values that you have to put in by hand, and you get uh, close enough within uh, measurement accuracy to the actual observed value, so you don't call it an anomaly anymore. So in that sense, it already suggests that the evidence itself is changed by moving to a new theory. So this is the summary thing. But the idea is just that it's supposed to have a theory which has only, so this is schematic, but the idea is if you have a theory, say, that only has two variables, and a certain part of it, uh, so this is the old omega, uh, is the evidence, and then you have like a new theory, but it uses uh, completely different variables. It could be that the old evidence can also be represented in it, but now it will be this three-dimensional object. Maybe there is a relation between the two such that, for instance, this is a, a project, uh, the old theory can be obtained by projecting the new one in a certain way or anything like that. But all these things, you can invent new rules how you will revise the probability. So in this case, the uh, probability will be really related to the um, area that I indicate here, or the volume here. You can have <coughs> rules about how to do this. But the point is that this is not uh, there in the orthodox uh, framework, where you just assume that you, you don't ever change the domain of the probability function. OK, so this brings me to what, what I said was naive about listing the theories here as these uh, low dimensional things. Actually, each of these things has an internal structure. It has a number of variables and uh, the evidence, but also the hypotheses and the predictions can be uh, pictured as areas or volumes within each of these uh, spaces. So the suggestion would be that uh, the work on, that has been done on conceptual spaces um, maybe well, we have to combine that with probability. And then, of course, we will have to supplement current pro probabilistic principles with new uh, ideas to, to, to tell us what, how to update probabilities in cases like this. So that would be our uh, suggestion that the new theory, um, in particular cases, it can be modeled as a language change, but there are uh, even worse cases where you have the whole dimensionality of the problem that changes. The old, uh, the old evidence will change as well. And what you are looking for is a conservative extension of the old Bayesianism, because of course we don't want to throw away the things that were already working. Um, now, this is just another way of phrasing that uh, what I've already been saying in a more general way, like Asianism sort of implicitly assumes that the true uh, or the best theory is already among the ones that are under explicit consideration. And one way how you can um, see that this is the case is uh, with results about uh, uh, being well calibrated. So <coughs> a Bayesian, so if you imagine an ideal uh, agent who is making forecasts under conditions of feedback, um, you will have to believe that he is well calibrated in the sense that uh, with probability one, in the long run, uh, his forecasts will converge to the actual uh, relative frequency. Now, to come back to these new theories, so I already mentioned that the whole conceptual space may change. But it can also happen that the sample space itself stays put, and it's only the language or the interpretation uh, that you use for the sample space that changes. Um, so basically, 
the way I view it is that your probabilistic model is this neat space and you sort of know what is going on and you disregard all other weird uh, possibilities, uh, but they are nevertheless, they are there. And in cases where you see that nothing works, at a certain point you will start looking actively for other alter alternatives. And this may lead you to expand the sample space. But what you could do alternatively, which is slightly better, is just to um, already build in the possibility that you may want to change your mind later on. And that would be the suggestion of a catch-all. Uh, so in practice, using a catch-all means that for every probability that you give explicitly, you are conditionalizing on the hypothesis that you can explicitly state. And so you, you are using all hypotheses except uh, uh, for the catch-all more or less as if it were your universe, as if it were all of your sample space. So you are sort of hiding for the problem here. Um, if you don't like this approach, what you could do is make a family of probability functions um, and give a, uh, every possible probability to the catch-all, but also that would be a departure from the usual Bayesian approach. So that's an option. And then I wanted to mention that uh, in, so in certain cases, uh, we do know what to do. How to revise the probability if something changes at the level of the algebra. So if you have a certain distinction that you can make among the sample space and that leads you to a number of hypotheses, and later on you realize that you actually you should also uh, have included another uh, property or a variable that is, um, yeah, you can, you can say you, you sort of identify a hidden variable um, there. Uh, you can come to a new partition of the sample space. So actually your algebra changes, but the sample space stays put. Um, and this, for this case, we do know what to do with the probabilities, how to revise them. And of course, you could see the use of a catch-all as a special <coughs> case. So if you do have new specific uh, theories emerging from the catch-all, you could see that as a product partition, uh, but the special case where the new distinction just is irrelevant for the other hypothesis, only, it only matters for the catch-all. And in that case, uh, you can actually find uh, in the literature already a suggestion what to do, and that is to minimize between the old probability function and the new probability function the cross-entropy distance function. So it's not all bad, there are cases where we sort of know what to do, but the very general problem, I would say, is still open. If even the dimensions of the uh, sample space will change, we are still trying to find the most general case where we can identify something in the spirit of a Bayesian idea behind motivating the change in probabilities. Um, so this brings me to my conclusion slides. So we want to uh, continue in this um, direction, so you want to find more special cases where we know how to revise the probabilities upon a change of the theory. Um, that should also help us to uh, even say more about the problem of all evidence, because that will also change in the new theory. It's still largely under construction, we just started working on this. Um, well, our question is actually whether Clark Eamon would, uh, maybe if we have a more concrete suggestion, we'd have less objections to being a uh, vegan. And yeah, that was all that I wanted to present. Thank you. So I could talk about this all day, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you'll be glad. Um, but um, so there, there are two versions of Bayesianism, but they overlap. And one is philosophical. It's a sort of normative theory about rationality and learning. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, there is a statistical practice which sometimes vaguely endorses the philosophical. Uh, now, 
partly to answer your question. I mean, of course, if you solved these problems, I would be less disinclined to be a Bayesian, but I probably wouldn't detach. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I have nothing against Bayesian statistics sensibly used. Uh, I, I make use of them. Um, I have a lot against Bayesian epistemology. So, uh, Bayesians early on, I mean, you can look at uh, some of you know, Hacking's early essays, realize, uh, although Hacking isn't a Bayesian, he was just putting it on their behalf, uh, realizing that people are logically limited, you want some adaptation of the norm. In fact, Bayesianism is a perfectly good, perfectly good uh, theory of rationality for Olympic gods who don't have any computational limitations. Now, uh, I haven't met any Olympic gods, uh, and for people it's a little more challenging. The first reason, the overall reason, actually is because we're computationally bounded. Usually that takes the form of reflecting that we're not logically omniscient, but there are other forms. Suppose you want to put probabilities over sentences in the first order language. Heim Geithman did, uh, uh, did a beautiful job. Uh, uh, and now suppose you want to be computationally bounded at the same time. Yeah? So because you're Bayesian, if two sentences are logically equivalent, you have to give that equivalence probability of one. Yeah? Which means take any logical truth and any any other logical truth, yeah, you have to give it probability one. Now think about Turing's theorem, and you get the result almost immediately that if you're a computationally bounded Bayesian, you not only have to give probability one to logical truths, but you have to give probability one to an uncomputably infinite set of logically contingent propositions. Be a Bayesian and computationally bounded, you must be infinitely dogmatic. Now, perhaps we're all infinitely dogmatic anyway, so we shouldn't worry so much, but still, it seems a caution. Uh, <clears throat> about the problem of, of uh, old evidence, um, I dreamed it up on leave uh, from Princeton in 1979, 1980, and I immediately confronted Dick Jeffrey uh, with it, and uh, he looked at me and he was quite puzzled. He thought about it, and he just stared, looking at me. Finally, he said, who cares whether a pig farmer is a Bayesian? And uh, stomped off. Uh, he, he later thought harder about it. I have never met a statistician, not one, who took the problem seriously. Uh, but the problem actually isn't original with me. I discovered after inventing it, for the second time, it's actually explicit in a book called Specification Searches by an economist, Edward Lemer. And it's a, it's a beautiful, simple example of Lemer's book I recommend it to you, although I can't recall it. Uh, <clears throat> Lemer, who's a Bayesian, uh, notes it, doesn't make much of it, and goes on. Yeah. Why, why don't statisticians recognize it? I think exactly, exactly for the reasons you gave. Bayesian statisticians are moderates. They functionally put probability one on the set of hypotheses they're looking at. Yeah? Uh, and they never consider a catch-all hypothesis. Why? Because there's no likelihood function for a catch-all hypothesis. So they, they just ignore it. So they don't get the problem. Um, now, I wouldn't call them humble Bayesians because I never met a humble statistician in my life, but uh, aside from the terminology, uh, I, uh, I think you've got it exactly right. One thing they do take seriously, and it drives them crazy, is double counting. Yes? Uh, Jim Berger, I, I presented the problem. Jim Berger is a distinguished statistician, author, author of a widely used textbook, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I remember presenting the problem to, to Berger, and he was completely baffled. He didn't get it. Well, how, how could there be a problem? 
On the other hand, Berger wrote uh, an account of the history of general relativity in which he tried to reconstruct it all as a, an example of perfect Bayesian reasoning. And uh, when I pointed out to him, common, uh, contrary what, to what you attribute to Otis, that Einstein used the anomalous advance of the perihelion systematically over a decade as a criterion for rejecting theories. Einstein had a whole bunch of gravitational theories. Every time he checked whether or not they gave the perihelion advance or they didn't, he threw them out. Yes? And uh, poor Berger was very unhappy because Einstein had done a Bayesian sin. Um, uh, I have more remarks I make about the history. I guess I want to make two remarks about three more actually about specific proposals. First of all, I, I found Dan Garber's proposal, which was basically what we learned is a logical relation. I found, it, I found it fascinating. I don't think it worked, but in some sense it's right. Uh, I don't know how to make it work out, but, uh, but it, I, thought, I thought it was quite insightful. The proposal of Joyce is very clever. You, you compare the probability, the posterior probability of the hypothesis on the evidence, the posterior probability of the hypothesis on the denial of the evidence. The, the problem is it's a philosopher's toy. Uh, and we, if you think about the denial, not, think about not the perihelion advance, right? Uh, that's an infinite disjunction. Yes? There are there are innumerable ways for it to be false. Yeah? And so we have no way of, of computing that probability. We don't even have plausibly a subjective probability for it. Uh, but more importantly, if in fact you really have the Bayesian stick in which confirmation is supposed to be a sort of ancillary feature of your changing your probability to degrees of belief on evidence, uh, the, uh, the old evidence problem remains, and Joyce's formulas don't solve it. Um, uh, on the other hand, your proposals about, you gave actually a couple in your written, written version. Uh, here you gave uh, one, where I've got a set of hypotheses, yeah? I've, I've got a set of other hypotheses, and I essentially take the cross product, yeah? Uh, And uh, it looks, although you don't explicitly suggest, that I basically, I've got these cells once I take the cross product, and I just distribute my prior uniformly through the cells. Yeah? And that's okay, it works out for the priors. The, the problem I see is that if I'm a Bayesian, I need likelihoods as well. And if I've got the probability evidence on H, and the probability of the evidence on F, I don't necessarily have the probability of the evidence on the conjunction. So I don't know, I don't have a rubric for getting the likelihoods in a sense. Now, of course, if I'm a real thoroughgoing subjectivist, I can make up anything I want, but uh, I don't have anything that looks like satisfying Bayesian strictures on updating. Uh, okay, thank you very much. That was very interesting.